to the Autistic Me podcast. I'm Christopher Scott Wyatt speaking as the Autistic Me. And today our guest is Heather Conroy of Evolve Coaching in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Heather has experience working with autistic individuals as they navigate college and career, uh, I guess, career skills. Sure, yeah. I don't know what the you would call it. The career world, right? There's, there's the skills of the individual and also I think the uh, expectations of the employer to navigate. You started working with Evolve how long ago? You founded it? Yeah, good question. So Evolve became a nonprofit in 2015, January of 2015. And prior to that, Joe Farrell and I have, have been supporting autistic college students since about 2010 under different names. Yeah. So Evolve has existed as Evolve, though, since 2015. Yeah. But you have almost 10 years of experience doing this, especially with college students. Right. What attracted you to working with individuals from neurodiverse backgrounds? It's also a really good question. So um, I have a master's in social work, um, and prior to getting that, that degree, I went to the University of Pittsburgh to get a bachelor's in psychology. So I knew that I wanted to quote unquote help people. And that's really as far as it went. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I heard from someone in a class of mine that there was a job called a TSS, therapeutic staff support, um, working with people with various diagnoses. And so I jumped at that opportunity. I thought that would be really fun. And I loved it. And my first two clients were on the spectrum and I just loved Every minute that I spent with them, um, I learned a lot from them and just really enjoyed that. So I then decided to seek out a school after, after having such a good experience. I wanted to find a school that focused on supporting kids with autism and ADHD. So I did that for about a year in North Carolina. And then I maybe begrudgingly didn't, didn't necessarily want to go back to school, but went back to school to get my master's at, at Pitt. Um, so I didn't know anyone on the spectrum um, ahead of time. You don't have a family member or anything like that, but uh, just kind of fell in love with it. And most people I've met do have that connection. They have a child, a brother, a sister, mm-hmm. a relative. So you were coming into this with a different perspective, an outsider's perspective. Definitely. In fact, I don't even recall in my undergraduate program learning about autism. Um, I had never met anyone with autism as far as I knew. Now that I know the numbers, right, I definitely did. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, but it was certainly an outsider's perspective. And as a TSS, and then in your coaching work, your job is to help someone, not to do things for them. So could you explain how you orient yourself towards helping the individual grow and gain skills? Sure. Yeah. So I guess, you know, in my earlier years as a TSS, I was working with people who didn't have as much agency for a number of reasons, their age and all of that. Um, But now I have, I guess, the luxury or at least it's something I very much enjoy. I, I get to work with adults. So these adults may be transitioning um, into sort of an independent phase of life, perhaps. Um, But I get to, one, help them recognize that they get to make decisions for themselves and that I'm here to help them to do that. Our whole team takes that approach. Um, And I also get the unique opportunity to help parents understand that they need to trust that their kids will First of all, that they'll succeed, but also that they will make mistakes, and that's part of growing up. So I get to support people uh, with their goals, help them to create goals of their own, and um, certainly we we take parent input and and our own input into that uh, process, but it's really exciting to have someone come to us uh, who gets to finally kind of take the wheel themselves, and and that's, that's pretty cool. The majority of questions I get to the Autistic Me blog and email to the podcast relate to academic success and professional success. The understanding being that if an individual doesn't get through school and college, 
personal life and other things are going to suffer. Hmm. So I assume, based on, on the students that I've met here at colleges and at high schools, that this is a very difficult time for individuals on the spectrum. Hmm. The autistic individual is trying to both navigate this pressure to be an academic success and a career success. Mm -hmm. And often you have parents also saying, now get a social life too on the side. <laughs> so how do you yeah. approach this very difficult transition period to young adulthood? Well, we individualize everything that we do. So every person that comes to us, we take, you know, not that we're just, uh, it's hard to explain, I suppose, <laughs> but it's really important for us to listen to our clients' interests and goals and hear from them what their strengths are and try to tease that out when we're conversing with them or talking about their resume or their work experience, if they have that work experience. Um, so we help people to identify, well, okay, you're living at home with your parents right now, okay, you know, do you want to go to school? Do you want to find a job? And also help them understand or just recognize, piece together, that if their goal is to leave their parents' home, for instance, this is a, a popular one, I think, on both sides. Um, if their goal is to leave their parents' house, but they don't know how to connect the dots to make that happen, we try to help them find the pathway to make that happen. So maybe someone isn't sort of intrinsically motivated right away to go to college or to start working, but they want to get out of the house. They want to have friends, let's say. You know, then we talk about the path to getting there. Well, if you want to have friends, that means you need to be able to have a little bit of money to go out and have ice cream with them or go see a movie or whatever. So helping them to connect the dots is sometimes uh, the approach we have to take. And do you work with counselors yeah. and support providers? We do. Um, so our approach, our, traf our staff is trained as therapists, right? So I'm a clinical social worker. I certainly could um, have just a regular, I guess, as you would expect, therapeutic uh, approach. And a lot, of our, a lot of what we do is therapeutic, um, but we really focus on the practical side of things, too. So I think any good therapist is going to meet a person where they are and help them meet their goals, right? So there's really not a big difference in my mind between a therapist and a coach, but oftentimes we do partner with therapists. So we may have a client who has interest in talking about um, or, or getting some emotional support, and that may not provide us with not enough time to focus on the practical piece. So we will absolutely work and often do work as a team with their other support folks. So, okay, here's a topic that you can discuss with your therapist, and here's a topic that we're going to work on together to make some progress with your applications, with your interviews, with whatever makes sense for you. In the autism community, one of the complaints is that services cost a lot of money and are difficult to obtain without mm -hmm. insurance and personal resources. Sure. How does Evolve Coach work, Coaching work that out? Um, it, it, being aware that this is a journey that costs money to make. It costs money to have a coach, costs money to have a therapist, you need insurance, you need resources. How does Evolve serve mm -hmm. a broad community? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so again, as a nonprofit, we started in 2015, and even at that point, we were pretty much only working with private pay clients. Um, and so that has always been, and even from you know 2010 when Joe and I started doing this work with with adults, um, it's always been very important to us to work with people from all walks of life. So we really recognized. Um, that we weren't meeting the need that we wanted to meet, but we had to get the business up and running. So for about a year, that was really, uh, the majority of the people we worked with were private pay. Now that said, we worked with sliding scales. There were a handful of people that we did support without asking for money. Um, and, but at this point, you know, we're really lucky to take advantage of the nonprofit status and seek grant funding. 
Um, in addition to that, we continue to work with and are hoping to um, develop more relationships with the Office of Vocational Re Rehabilitation. So it's important to us to spend the time building relationships with funders uh, to make sure that anyone who needs this support can access it and that money isn't the only thing that stands in their way. That would seem to be a major concern for parents and caregivers that the autistic individual might not be able to continue supports into adulthood. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Because even with the Affordable Care Act, health insurance does expire at 26, I believe. Absolutely, yeah. So what does someone look forward to as they get into their mid to late 20s? So many things, Scott. I think whether you have a diagnosis or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so at in high school, kids are provided with a lot of supports, and that's why oftentimes students and their families will choose to bank their diploma and even stay in school to continue to access services. Um, but that ends at 21. You know, at, at 22, you have to find other services. So, and also a tidbit that um, many people don't know is that if you have only an autism spectrum disorder and you'd like to get therapy, that at the age of 22 is not something you can do via that diagnosis alone. So you need to have another mental health diagnosis so that an insurance company can reimburse whoever the provider is, be it a large hospital system or be it your, you know, friendly psychologist down the road, you know? So um, there's a lot you say to look forward to, <laughs> and I know there's, there's sarcasm in that, um, but there's a lot to navigate, um, and we really work to help people try and figure those things out as well. Um, there's also the adult autism waiver that uh, people are on an interest list uh, for sometimes many years waiting to get services that uh, fit their needs. So it's sort of, it's a big reason we do what we do because there are, there is a huge lack of services for this population. Um, you know, when I started working with children, I didn't anticipate that when they aged out of the school system, they were also aging out of various other systems. Um, so that's why we work really hard to figure out sort of the funding. You know, it, it's very important to us. Um, yeah. And when you work with autistic young adults, you are working with a group that wasn't always classified as autistic. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And so for many of them, they didn't necessarily grow up with the label autistic. They mm -hmm. may have been PDD and OS under the sure. older DSM mm -hmm. categories, may have from a, a therapist been labeled Asperger's, mm -hmm. which I don't believe was ever an official DSM. It was. It was? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it was in the DSM-4 TR? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now with the DSM-5, all of that has changed. There's autism? Right. <laughs> so some yeah. of these people are trying to navigate new identities, mm. new understandings of themselves? Yeah, I think so. Um, y you know, and everyone takes a different path. So I've been lucky to meet through this job um, a lot of autistic advocates. Um, and so I mentioned my schooling as a clinical social, well, as a social worker, and now I have my license in clinical social work. Um, but everything that I was ever taught was you use person first language always. So meaning person with autism or person with a disability. And so I'm that is just one tidbit, one small thing that I'm learning from autistic advocates that many people prefer to be addressed by identity first language. Um, so it's one thing that opened my eyes because that was, it made me cringe to say that at first because I had been taught for so long to, to speak a certain way. Um, but it's really important to listen to, why, why, why listen only to parents and to therapists when we have individuals with that diagnosis telling us what they prefer? So again, not everyone agrees with that, but 
it's it's been one thing that's been really interesting to me. Um, right. So, but there are other people who say, you know, I'm I'm an Aspie. I'm someone with Aspergers, and that is always how I'll, how I will identify myself. Um, and that's okay, right? It's not my job to tell someone how they should refer to themselves. Um, so it, some people have, have kind of gradually come to terms with, I guess, a, for lack of a better phrase, um, this new label. But I also, you know, it's, what is it? It's um, the summer of 2018, and I don't know how long the DSM-5 has been out exactly, but uh, I still see people get diagnoses of Asperger's, new diagnoses. So there's there's a learning curve, I think, for people on the spectrum, for therapists, for psychologists, people providing diagnoses. When an individual is diagnosed with any neurodiverse condition and getting ready to approach a school or an employer, questions of disclosure are very difficult to work through. And I know coaches sometimes help address the, the anxieties with higher education under ADA, you have to disclose to receive services. Right. And with employers, the laws, the way the courts have ruled, it's hit and miss. But most have said you have to give a fair warning that you're going to seek accommodation. So mm -hmm. most employers will ask. Mm -hmm. How do you approach that with a group of people, typically I'm thinking 18 to 20 something. I, sure, I, I surely didn't want to be saying, help me. Right. So yeah. how do you coach someone to disclose with, when they don't want to seem needy and dependent? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we talk about uh, whether accommodations are even needed on the job first or at school. Typically, there is something. And it's not your, your usual, it's not always that someone needs extended time on a test. Um, but it may be that this student will benefit from having a conversation with their professor about what they need in the classroom. And maybe that is standing up and taking breaks during the class, walking around the class. Um, that may be seen as distracting for some people, um, but having a conversation with the professor about how to take care of your needs in that way while not distracting the professor and the class is really important instead of just going ahead and doing that. Um, so we talk to people about, well, what is your end goal? And then again, we help them connect the dots. Okay, so you want to succeed in school? You want to get a job? All right, so let's think about, is, do you have a special need, a specific need at school or at work? And if so, let's figure out how to make that happen. Um, and also, I remind people that, you know, especially professors, they get, if they have a class full of 100 people, they're probably getting 15 uh, memos for accommodations for the students in that class. I don't know what the number is, but I know that it's something they get often. So I try to normalize this process uh, for our students specifically. You know, you're going to talk with your professor, or rather you're going to give him this memo, him or her this memo. Um, one, you get to decide if you have a, a conversation about this. You also get to decide if you specify the exact diagnosis, that's up to you. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, you don't have to. But you do have needs, and let's make sure you, you get those so that you can be on the same playing field. It doesn't put you at an advantage. It allows you to be at the same starting point as the other people in that class. As a coach, you sit down and you, you interview the individual and decide on his or her goals. Mm -hmm. And most of us don't really have clear goals. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'm, a, I'm almost 50, I don't have clear goals. But, you know, especially as a young person. So the goal has to be simple, I assume, like get out of school, get the first job. These are bite-sized goals. Well, yes. So, but that, I mean, then we have to break that down because get the first job is a massive goal, right? So then, then we have to say, what does this mean, right? So what is your job that you're looking for? Does that require a degree? That might be the first step. Okay, if it does or doesn't require a degree, then we take the next step. So we really take people down a path of questioning to help them 
figure out what they're comfortable with um, and help them to just sort of, again, connect the dots, piece things together to understand fully, because I didn't at that age, um, what are all of the things that need to happen in order for me to reach this goal? And maybe should I start much lower? Should I start by saying, I'm going to try one online class and see how that goes? I have a fear of being around people. Okay, I'm not someone who's going to push one of my students to go out into the world and be in you know, a giant classroom at the University of Pittsburgh or some other large school. I'm going to work with them to take small steps to ensure that they experience success. Because I do find that a lot of people come to us um, feeling like a failure, but that no one understands them, you know, that they haven't met their goals in the past, so what's the point now? So again, we really try to point them to finding success, feeling happy about that success, and then making the next step. And it is important for this student to be able to sit in a classroom at some point, probably, depending on what their goal is, but we might just take things slowly. How long does someone typically receive coaching services through Evolve? It's another good question. So um, I have worked with students for one semester, um, and I've worked with a student for five years while they got their master's degree um, in five years. So, and honestly, that student didn't need me for all of those five years, but there was a comfort zone, I think, that he and his parents just didn't want to mess with. <laughs> They're like, this is working, so let's make sure this is still in place. Um, and when it comes to supporting people who are maybe looking for, you know, finding better relationships or maintaining relationships or finding work, um, that can absolutely vary. Often what I find um, happening is that people will meet one goal and then they may have another goal and they want to continue working with us. I think it's my job, though, our team's job, to tell someone, you know what, you are ready. You're ready to go and do this on your own. I'm not going anywhere, so you can call me if you feel like you need some more support, but you're okay. And I think that's the ethical thing to do when I feel someone's ready to move on. The need for coaches is somewhat frustrating for me. Our universities and our K-12 system are badly insufficient at guiding students with special needs of all kinds and even normal students in some ways Yeah, sometimes <laughs> and when I talk to the students that I've had at local universities or, or elsewhere who have struggled with neurodiversity they often feel that the specialist in disability services understand wheelchairs mm -hmm. and they understand uh, vision issues and hearing issues but executive function and planning those aren't perceived as disabilities mm -hmm. in quite the same way as even dyslexia might be. Sure, yeah. So in many ways, do you find that you have to supplement a system that just isn't ready to deal with our needs? Um, yes and no. So yes, I think everything, especially at the university level, everything that we're doing is supplementing and in partnership with the services that already exist. Um, it wouldn't make sense for us to try and do all of that ourselves because those services are there. Now, can your typical disability services office support someone on a once or twice weekly basis? That's pretty rare. Um, and in addition to those meetings, we're texting our students and emailing our students reminders. You know, we do what we can to continue to make sure that they're staying accountable. And so in that way, we do supplement what the schools provide, and I think they're really grateful for that because they also recognize that their time is limited. Um, and in addition to that, you know, it's – so you mentioned executive function. Um, in 2010, when we started doing this work, um, no one knew what that was at the school level, the parent level. It was rare that we found someone who knew – that term. But now I do see, even if it's just because they want to use a buzzword, at least the schools know what that is now, which is great. <laughs> so there has been progress in the last There has years. absolutely been progress. Now, in terms of people having the time to provide the support, I don't know how much that's changed. I do think schools are 
certainly making efforts. Um, so what we do to try and bridge that gap, though, is we provide um, often free uh, trainings to schools and universities to help them recognize the ways in which they can support students with neuro, who are neurodiverse. Um, I think that's been really helpful. And then that also allow you know, we also open it up to say, hey, even if we're not working with the student you have in your class, you can call us or you can email us and ask us questions because it's for the greater good. This may or may not be something that Evolve Coaching directly supports, but I know that you're familiar with uh, support groups for young adults and adults with autism. Mm -hmm. I have visited and spoken to those groups, and I have seen that they have a, a mixed record. Sometimes they're very mentor-based. Here's mm -hmm. how to succeed. Here's what I did. Here's what's working. And other times they're very... I, I hate to say it, but s solemn and melancholy, almost depressing. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, they are depressing. <laughs> where everyone is, is merely unhappy. Hmm. So how do you connect your clients with good mentors from the community, or how do you encourage them to find positive energy sure. for success? Yeah, well, I think there are a few. Let me gather my thoughts here, because I have a few different approaches to this. Um, so... I, Two groups come to mind that I have volunteered with in the past and currently um, via Autism Connection of PA. Uh, there's a discussion group uh, that happens twice, sorry, now once a month. Um, that discussion group does sometimes uh, become melancholy. I think that's an appropriate word for it. Um, but I think that the leaders, the facilitators of that group do a really good job of making sure that everyone um, gives their input into what the topic will be next next time and make sure that we don't go down that path of just woe is me because while it's important to connect with people and have that outlet, that we, we can't make it all about that um, because that's, that's not what life is all about. Um, there's another group where we get to really just have fun. Um, it's not so therapeutic. Uh, at least not overtly. Um, we go to Kennywood. Um, we do all the stimmy things that um, I frankly get exhausted by. <laughs> but it seems like, you know, we have outings, uh, bowling, like uh, movies, 3D movies. I'm just like, where is this coming from? But okay. Um, but it seems like as long as people are prepared to go into that environment, they seem really happy. And we, again, I let them choose what they do. Um, what was the other thing that I was thinking? Oh, finding mentors in the community. Um, you know, I think throughout the, you know, nine years, um, that, that we've been doing this work, I've gotten a chance to meet lots of different people. Um, so I have been able to connect now. I've got this nine year, uh, history, right? So now I'm able to connect people with mentors. And recently about a year ago, I was able to do that, very successfully, uh, <laughs> just found a really good match, someone who was leaving college, but still really needed, I don't know, just needed to see that another person similar to him in some ways was successful and kind of living his truth and, and having a, you know, a reasonably great life. Um, so they connect about every month. I check in with that mentor and that's still going on. Um, yeah, so, you know, again, I'm lucky to meet a lot of different interesting people, and I hope that continues so I can keep connecting people. Now, before we conclude this podcast episode, I want to lead into uh, an exciting topic. You work with the Joey Travolta Film Camp. Sure. Mm -hmm. And Arts for Autism. Yeah. And you are a big believer in actually hands-on experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. And... How important is it for neurodiverse individuals to have those real-life productive experiences as they prepare for college and then the job market? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, you know, having real-life experience on your resume is going to speak volumes much more than, you know, I attended a class. So just the sort of practical nature of getting that experience in is obviously really important. Um, but I do find 
really just like anyone. Like I want to make sort of a sweeping generalization about people with autism benefit from hands-on experience. I think that's true of everyone. Um, and I also think it's true, I know it's true, unfortunately, that these young people and sometimes often not so young people um, are challenged to find experiences. So I do my best to, you know, forge pathways and find people who will provide those experiences to teach and to allow people to have hands-on learning, um, real job experience. Um, and then also via Arts for Autism, um, we've spent a lot of energy and time, which has all been <laughs> certainly worth it, really exciting, um, to start a series of workshops so that um, some of these individuals who are very interested in the film industry can continue their learning. Um, so recently we wrapped a, uh, a shoot for the film Parallels. Um, we're very excited about that and it opened up lots of doors into the, the community. So we were lucky to have um, you know, local grips and actors and sound folks, like lots of people coming in and chipping in, uh, volunteering their time to be a part of this project. And they got to see these individuals, some on the spectrum and some not, just like shine. Um, and so I know that there will be, and there have been, I've already set up an informational interview with one of the actors um, on the set, but I know that there will be future experiences just, be just because of that connection that has been made among the community members and the people on the spectrum uh, on that film set. As Evolve has continued now to grow, you've gone between two people, Joe and yourself, <laughs> yeah. to a staff. Yeah. And a board. Right. And a beautiful office complex. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Where do you see Evolve going? Well, um, we, <laughs> we have a lot on the horizon. Um, let's put it that way. So it's really important for us to make college coaching affordable for everyone. So that is our number one goal at the moment. Um, again, partnering with funders. Uh, to make that happen. So, and fundraising, doing the work ourselves as well. Um, so that's our, a really big goal of ours to, you know, you mentioned the sort of the lack of services that are sometimes available at schools. We want to make that better. Um, so again, that's, that's maybe the first goal that comes to mind. And also, you know, you know, the, the stats for employment, um, 85 to 90% of people on the spectrum are unemployed or underemployed, and that is simply not okay. So we continue to work with uh, our clients to feel good about interviews, uh, choose the right jobs to apply for, um, you know, but it's also really, really important to us to change the minds of, or just inform community members who are not autistic. So what does it mean to hire someone with a disability or someone with autism? You know, talking with um, employers, uh, HR representatives, coworkers about what this looks like and helping them understand that it's not scary. It's not just about giving someone a chance and sort of a, you know, a, a charitable thing. You can really benefit from hiring a diverse staff and that doesn't, only mean that you're hiring women or the LGBT community, that means that you're, you know, hiring people of all walks of life, including those with disabilities. And we remind people that a large percentage of our population will experience a disability at some point in their lives. So we talk about those numbers and make it real for everyone. Um, so, you know, so we want to continue doing what we're doing, but on a larger scale because it's exciting work and because... We love the work. I want to thank Heather Conroy for joining the Autistic Me podcast. I am Christopher Scott Wyatt, and my thanks to Heather Conroy of Evolve Coaching in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott.